as I was saying, hello everyone and, and welcome to the fall webinar series or the, the first seminar in our fall series for the Climate Change and Health Working Group within the Canadian Coalition on Global Health Research. I'm the co-chair of the working group along with my colleague David Zakis, who you'll hear from at the end of today's webinar, but I'm also with the University of Saskatchewan. And as I say, we're thrilled to be here to kick this series off, but also to hear from Trevor Hancock and Cora Holsworth, really at a, a pivotal time when we're talking about not only the pandemic, but also how we restart after the pandemic and the opportunities for green growth and the opportunities to build healthier and, and more resilient communities. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. I'm going to put a plug in for the rest of the series because we have some, some great topics coming up for discussion. So October 19th, as part of the Canadian Conference on Global Health, we'll have a panel linking knowledge and expertise to enhance climate change related health research and practice and exploring the opportunities for a community of practice around climate change and health and, and what that looks like in Canada. And then in November, we're going to hear from Tim DeCaro from the uh, from Simon Fraser University on the health benefits of green growth. And we'll wrap up this term with uh, Paivi Abernathy, who will be talking on December 8th about the invisible victims of climate change, children's environmental health in the changing climate. And so again, welcome to have you there. The information is on the CCGHR and the Climate Change and Health Working Group website, and you can register in the same way that you have for this one. And all of the recordings are posted after the fact in case you can't make one. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Vic Neufeld for introductions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Corinne. Let me add my welcome. I'm a member of the uh, working group on climate change and health as well, and uh, various other things in the Canadian coalition. I live in Victoria now, after many years in Hamilton with McMaster University. Um, just to pause on the fact that I live in Victoria, let me acknowledge uh, with respect the people on whose traditional territory uh, the university, but also other universities and organizations across the country whose uh, historical relationships with the land of Canada continue to this day. Special thanks to Trevor and Cora for joining us today. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge their help with sorting out the theme and the support materials and so on uh, a couple of times in discussions leading up to today. Um, in a minute, I'll turn over to uh, Trevor to get the discussion started. And at the right point, he'll ask Cora to jump in and then we'll wrap up at the end. We're aiming to have about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, at the end of the time for, for your questions and comments. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the chat box. If you have some specific questions, please put them in there. Uh, if you wish to uh, uh, have either Trevor or Cora be a responder to that, just say so specifically. Um, Emily Coxis, who's the coordinator for the student and young professionals, a group in the coalition is going to help monitor the questions. And I'll just pause for a moment and ask Emily if I've missed anything in this preamble. Nope, that's everything. Just a quick note to everyone that we are recording this session. Um, so the recording will be available to those that couldn't make it on our CCJHR website after the fact. Uh, I just mentioned one other thing, if I could, and that is We've uh, made a special point of inviting uh, colleagues associated with uh, uh, universities who are institutional members of the coalition. There are 29 of them now and hope that uh, in some way they'll be involved in follow up activities. Uh, you've seen some of those in the questions on the preparation guide and uh, 
Trevor will give us some more things to think about along that line. And just at the end, I will jump in and ask uh, our colleague David Zakis to make any closing comments. So that's the plan. Welcome everybody again. And over to you, Trevor, please. Thank you and uh, good morning, or I guess for some of you, good afternoon. Um, I'm just gonna turn my video off. I'm, I've got a bit of an overloaded computer here and my uh, PowerPoint just shut down on me twice in a row. So uh, we'll have to see if this works. If not, I have a backup plan. Uh, but I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will work. And Trevor, I have your slides as well. If you do have a problem, I can show them. Looks like we're in business. Okay, okay and very nice to, uh, I, I just wanna confirm you can see that. Yes, okay. So um, first of all, very nice to see David Zakas online. He and I go back way more years than we're willing to discuss. Um, so let me tell you what we're gonna talk about this morning. First of all, I know your focus is climate change, but our message is that this is actually bigger than climate change, what we're talking about. Uh, so I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, the Anthropocene, the Ecological Determinants of Health and One Planet Living. And then Cora is going to talk about the ecological footprint and its measurement at a local level and the One Planet approach. And then I'll come back in with some thoughts about both the health co-benefits of that and the role of the university. Um, I, I hope this first bit will be for many of you a refresher because um, we've done a session before on, on public health in the Anthropocene. Um, in the material that went round, we made the point that 81% of Canadians and well over half of humanity live in cities. So in many ways, the sustainability issues that we face globally will be decided to a large extent in the cities where most people live. And also because cities historically have been leaders, whether you're thinking about water sanitation or whether you're thinking about uh, tobacco control or whether you're thinking about a whole host of other initiatives it has often been the cities rather than national governments that have taken the lead and I have I play, place great faith in municipalities. So more than climate change if you haven't seen this video you might want to take a look at it sometime it's been around for oh I think eight years now um, but the notion of the Anthropocene which was launched around 2000 really and it's um, has become a very important theme of, as it says here, we have been so successful that we have created a new geologic epoch, and I'm not going to go into all of that. The key point is that the Anthropocene is much more than just climate change. It includes at least all these other things. And for those of you who are uh, accustomed to thinking about the social determinants of health, I would just point out that these things are the ecological determinants of health and of course are very much driven by social and economic development. They're all happening at the same time and so really this constitutes when put together an existential challenge for our societies today. And if that isn't a health issue, I don't know what is. So we did this report uh, five years ago now on the ecological determinants of health. And um, this is uh, our summary of those key ecological determinants. This is, of course, the very stuff of life that we're talking about. So the earth provides us with all of these things, including all of the materials. Look around where you're sitting. Everything around you came from the earth. All of the fuels that we're using to power this webinar and everything else come ultimately from nature. And um, we also get services such as UV protection and waste decomposition and so on. And of course, for the past 11,000 years, a relatively stable and benign climate, which we have now are in the process of disrupting, along with all those other Earth systems. And I know Cora has a slide later on about the uh, planetary boundaries and the Earth systems that we're starting to disrupt. Um, so this led at the same time as our report to the Rockefeller and Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. Uh, their report came out the same time as ours, a bit after ours actually. Um, and they were focused on what Richard Horton in defining planetary health had called the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. So we are concerned both with the health of people and societies, but also the state, or if you like, the health of the natural systems on which we all ultimately depend for everything, for life and health itself. And as they said in that report, 
we have been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize economic and development gains in the present. Or as Jonas Salk put it, we have not been responsible ancestors. We have been um, depleting future resources. We have been uh, creating problems for future generations to meet our own needs today, which is the very opposite, the antithesis of the definition of sustainable development. In Canada, we act as if we had all of this, 4.7 planets, that's our current ecological footprint. But as we know, we actually have this. So somehow we have to go from 4.7 planets to what I call and others call our fair share of the Earth's biocapacity and resources. So this is fundamentally a social justice issue on a global scale. We need to get to be a one planet community, which is what we're working on here in, in Victoria and Saanich, uh, a, a, a one planet Canada. And for us in Canada, that means an almost 80% reduction in our ecological footprint. In this region where I live, it's about a 75% reduction because we have a slightly smaller footprint, but it's still a massive reduction in our ecological footprint. And quite rapidly as well. But at the same time, we have to meet basic needs and ensure high levels of human and social development and good health for everyone. Health for all remains an objective. So the grand challenge of our age, I would say, is how do we live equitably in harmony with each other and with nature and in good health on this one small planet that we call home? So that's the grand challenge we face, not just as, as health professionals and academics, but as, uh, as uh, universities, as organizations, as individuals, as communities. So Cora, I'm going to turn it over to now, is going to take this down to the local level and talk about the ecological footprint and the One Planet approach. Great. Uh, there, here we go. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yep. Great. So thanks, Trevor. I'm really happy to be with all of you here today. Um, I'm coming to you today from Saanich in Greater Victoria on the unceded territory of the Wasanic peoples. I'm a senior associate with One Earth with whom I'm leading the One Planet Saanich initiative and also manager of municipal programs at BCIT's Center for Eco Cities in which we're helping cities evaluate and understand their ecological footprints and consumption impacts. I also partner with Trevor Hancock on work in which we're aiming to create a one planet region here in Greater Victoria. So as Trevor said, uh, climate change is just one of the planetary boundaries we're bumping up against, and these are interconnected challenges. These global challenges are a result of the overconsumption of Earth's resources. We have limited biocapacity on the Earth, uh, on our planet. Only about a quarter of our planet's surface is currently ecologically productive, and scientists estimate that our fair Earth share is 1.5 global hectares per person. But right now we're in overshoot. Globally, humanity is using about 2.5 he global hectares per person. And we humans are contributing to ever increasing demand due to our steady population growth and to the fact that most of us un have unsustainable consumption habits. So climate change is just one manifestation of our overconsumption of Earth's resources. So this is why we need to take a hard look at consumption. In Canada, we live in consumer societies. When you factor in our imports and the embodied energy and materials of our consumption habits, that is the energy and materials that went into producing our goods and services we use, factoring all these in essentially doubles our carbon, fo our ecological footprint, our carbon footprint. We need to reduce global emissions and demands on nature. So it is critical to look at our consumption based emissions and the full impacts of our resource demands through the ecological footprint. When we research and share information about these consumption related impacts, we can inspire people to make changes in their personal lives and then reduce their personal impacts. And this can be power, empowering and motivating. A metric that can help us understand the impacts of consumption is the ecological footprint. It's a measurement tool that we can use to figure out how close or how far we are from one planet living. The footprint was developed here in BC by Bill Reese and Matisse Wackernagel at UBC. 
and it's an estimate of how much biologically productive land and water area an individual or population needs to produce all the resources it consumes and to absorb the waste that it generates. So importantly, this metric does factor in the impacts of carbon dioxide emissions as well, as it includes the amount of land required to sequester or absorb the carbon dioxide emissions that we're generating. So this slide is a bit technical, but you're all university people here, so that, that's good. Uh, I wanted to show you how the ecological footprint connects to the carbon footprint. So these are the key metrics that we're collecting information on through my work in BCIT, uh, working with communities. So the first uh, bar here is the territorial emissions. So we collect information on the typical, this is the typical type of greenhouse gas emission inventory that communities will generate. We also, though, look at the consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which include uh, the things that, are, as I already mentioned, the things that go into making our foods and goods and services we consume, plus the embodied energy and materials of our buildings and infrastructure in our communities. And finally, in the ecological footprint, uh, we convert this into a land-based metric, showing how much physical land area we're occupying, as well as the land area that's required to produce all these goods and services and absorb the waste, including carbon dioxide, as I mentioned. So I'm going to show you some of the results of the work we did here in Greater Victoria. And this is one of the communities that I've been working with, with BCIT. You saw from Trevor's slides that if everyone lived like the average Canadian, we'd need about five planets to support us. We're doing a bit better here in Greater Victoria, uh, but we'd still need the equivalent of four planets worth of resources to, to sustain us globally if everyone consumed uh, like we did on the planet. So there's tremendous health implications uh, associated with these key impact areas that you see on the bottom of the screen as well. I'm going to show you what some of the key drivers are for the put footprint, and then Trevor is going to discuss potential health co-benefits of taking action on reducing our footprint as well. So um, the first key point is that what, when you look at consumption-based emissions, uh, you get basically a doubling of the impact. So our emissions essentially are double that of a typical inventory. So this is showing that we're offshoring our emissions, uh, produce, things are produced elsewhere. And when you take account for those, our emissions are, are double. Um, and even more so when you look at the ecological footprint, our impacts are even greater still. Another key piece here is that um, typical inventories don't include food. Uh, consumption-based inventory does, and then the impact of food in the ecological footprint is even greater still. It's half, half of this pie for Greater Victoria, and that's because of the land and energy intensity of food production. So looking at our food, I'm going to show you a bit of the details for each of these components of the pie. Uh, so looking at our food, uh, we see that the majority of the impacts are due to the consumption of animal products. And this is because, as I said, the land intensity of uh, this particular uh, food production, uh, so very land intensive and energy intensive uh, for dairy production, cheese in particular, in particular which is uh, sad news to many. Uh, so another interesting fact is that the energy and land area required to produce our food vastly overshadows the impact of food miles. So this is surprising to many as there's been such a, a great emphasis on food miles. And this isn't to say that it's not uh, important to shift to local food production. That definitely is important as well. Uh, it just shows that we need to also work hard on reducing the energy intensity and land intensity of food production. And this can be done in part by shifting to more plant-based diet, uh, which has a lot less impact land-wise and energy-wise, um, and also uh, reducing food waste. More importantly, I'd say uh, focusing on food waste. Uh, we know that up to 50% of food can be wasted throughout the supply chain and consumption. Uh, so, and this actually last point can also be an argument to shift to local food as a uh, large industrial complex for agriculture um, is a very wasteful system as well. So more local small scale supply can help reduce food waste. And importantly, local, health, uh, local and heavily plant-based diets can also produce tremendous health outcomes that Trevor is going to talk about. So in buildings, we see nearly three quarters of the impacts are due to operating energy. So that's the energy going into heat and power our homes. 
Uh, but the piece that's often not communicated is that embodied energy and materials that go into producing the buildings. And this will make up a growing portion of the pie when we start to, as we continue to improve the efficiency of our buildings um, and also switching to different fuel sources. So looking at the consumables footprint, uh, so these are clothes, electronics, paper, plastic, et cetera. We see that the energy and materials that go into producing the goods we're using have a much greater impact on the food, on, on the footprint, sorry, than the disposal of the goods themselves. So this kind of turns planning on its head for municipalities. There's often been an emphasis on recycling, making sure recycling programs are working well. But really, this shows that you know the impact is heavily driven by the total consumption that's occurring. So we need to focus on reducing overall consumption, not just focusing on recycling and handling the waste properly. Uh, so we know also from research that having less stuff can make us happier as well, um, less clutter and such. Um, arguably, as a result of this, also potentially happy, healthier as well. So finally, similar to typical greenhouse gas emission inventories, private vehicles do, does dominate the ecological footprint related to transportation and a shift to less dependency on via, private vehicle trans, based trans, transportation can help individuals and communities achieve huge health outcomes as well. So what are we doing with this information? Uh, here in Saanich, in Greater Victoria, where we joined the International One Planet Cities pilot project, and this is being led by Bioregional UK. They're the founders of BEDZED, and that's one of the first sustainable neighborhood developments in the world. They're also creators of the One Planet Living Framework. And this pilot is aimed at helping cities drive down their ecological and carbon footprint through collaborative action planning. And through this work, we're building local and international network to share ideas and support each other and learn together. And we've been working closely with Vic uh, Newfeld's uh, son on this. Mark Newfeld is one of the represents one of the schools that we're working with here in Saanich. So the core of this work are two key metrics: the, as I said, the ecological footprint and greenhouse gas emissions, as well as these one planet living principles. So collectively, these serve as a guide to formulate individual and collective actions and action plans. And these principles are simple, easy to communicate and align with the sustainable development goals. And importantly here, you'll see they start with health and happiness. And Trevor's going to talk about these principles a bit more in his slides as well. So in Saanich, what we did with um, the One Planet Living approach is we started with building this understanding of the footprint and we created a sustainability scan looking using those principles as a lens to identify where we're where we currently are and where we need to get to. Then we engage community uh, organ and organizations in a conversation about one planet living and organizations then developed connected actions to address priorities identified in the scan. So we know that collaboration across our region will get us to local solutions faster and that's the whole goal of the project. So just a quick demonstration of how we communicate results and priority action areas. So from those numbers I showed you, we kind of communicate what are these key uh, focus areas within these different domains of our impact. And this helps the organizations prioritize their efforts. So for example, uh, we heard from one local school that having these numbers help them show that they need to go beyond just building a better recycling system, uh, but rather focus their effort on reducing the overall consumption of stuff. So uh, having sharing systems set up in the school um, for, uh, for clothes, clothes swaps and book swaps and things like that. So far, we've engaged 17 stakeholders and helped them build their own One Planet Action Plans, including businesses, schools, and community groups. And we hope to extend this initiative to the region. That's what I'm working with Trevor on. And it could also be used as a model in other regions, which is the aim of the international initiative to scale and replicate these efforts. So based on what we've done here in Saanich, uh, some of the things that could be done elsewhere, uh, working with local governments, we can work to evaluate and understand their ecological footprint and consumption-based emissions. Uh, we can undertake a sustainability scan uh, and then engage key stakeholders to in, help guide their efforts with this, these priorities, uh, creating one planet actions or action plans. 
Then for schools, uh, we can work with them to also build action plans and collaboration networks uh, locally and internationally and helping them prioritize their actions to footprint reducing uh, those, those actions that will dr dramatically reduce footprint impacts. So some actions that could occur in schools, uh, food gardens, running annual eco fairs, engaging local community in conversation about the need for one planet living as well. For businesses, we think there's a unique opportunity right now in this time to help businesses as they start to, to build back uh, or bounce forward better from the post-COVID recovery uh, when we're there. Uh, we can support businesses by connecting them with knowledge, knowledge and resources about alternatives. So we've been hearing over and over that one of the key challenges is the access to knowledge. knowledge. So for example, what are the highest impact opportunities and how can they overcome barriers to action? So how, how can they help accelerate behavior change and access information on government support uh, programs? So a network like One Planet Region can help bridge this gap and provide the access to this knowledge. We're also excited at BCIT to be developing this tool. It's an app for individuals uh, currently being developed. Uh, so this will be for individuals to help them identify top ways to reduce their footprint. So we're offering this in communities that have created their ecological footprint assessments too. So it connects to the community-based numbers and it helps people track progress and share ideas with an online community. It sort of contain a quiz to collect information and then calculate individuals foot, foot, uh, footprint and provide targeted recommendations. So this help, helps identify those priorities. And we're also collecting information in this about barriers too, which will help inform government action to figure out what, how they should prior, the local government should prioritize their efforts as well. So I'm going to, that's, that's my slides. And I'm going to hand it back to Trevor who's going to talk more about the health opportunities associated with this uh, One Planet Living approach and about engaging individuals. So thank you, Trevor. I'll hand it back over. Thank you. So thank you, Cora. And I'm going to pick up from there and um, move through some slides that deal with both the health co-benefits and the role of uh, academics, uh, universities and individuals and citizens. So um, I have uh, set up an NGO here in this region called Conversations for a One Planet Region. And um, our vision, as you can see, is of a, basically a one planet region with a high quality of life and a long life and good health for all. Um, and uh, our core belief is that right now we're not even talking about this. We are talking about climate change. We're not talking about the much larger set of challenges that Cora and I have outlined, never mind putting together some plans to deal with it. So places have climate action plans, for example, but they don't have one planet action plans. So let me just touch on some of the health co-benefits. So Cora's already talked about this set of uh, principles for One Planet Living from Bioregional. Um, and just note that the first one is health and happiness, as she said, but the next two are also about social and cultural issues, economy, equity, and so on. So this is really social sustainability combined with ecological sustainability. And the rest are the sort of, if you like, the standard um, e ecological challenges. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail. The PowerPoint will be available to you. And in fact, there are some additional slides that are hidden in the PowerPoint that you'll be able to see. But if you took each of those 10 principles here, you can find or not the first, the, the nine after health and happiness. And I like incidentally that happiness is part of this mental well-being, if you like. For each of them, you can identify health co-benefits. So in broad terms, we know that cities and countries with greater equity have better health and social outcomes. That was uh, uh, Pickett and Wilkinson's work some years ago. We know that local economies create local jobs and local wealth. <clears throat> we know about the importance of strengthening culture and strengthening social connections and strengthening a sense of community and belonging. We know about uh, better health comes from low pollution, from an adequately and properly planned city, uh, from nature contact. We know obviously about the, adequate, the importance of an adequate supply of clean water and good sanitation. Uh, we know about the health benefits of 
uh, a, a less meat-centered, uh, healthier diet. Uh, we know about the health benefits of uh, more active transportation and public transit in terms of not just air pollution uh, and greenhouse gas emissions, but injuries are reduced, physical activities increased, social connections can be increased on public transit too. And then, uh, and so on. So there are health co-benefits of of cleaner, greener products in terms of reduced costs to produce them, reduce environmental impacts, reduced wastes if we uh, use less stuff. And less stuff is one of the key elements of a one planet community. Uh, and then uh, the health benefits of, of zero waste and obviously the health benefits of zero carbon energy. So uh, the potential uh, of some of the top uh, items which are identified in uh, Cora's work with um, Jenny Moore for Saanich to eliminate fossil fuel emissions, convert half of gasoline private vehicles to electric, reduce purchase of non-food consumables as well as meat and dairy and less food in general. You can imagine all the health co-benefits that could accumulate from that and that needs to be and can be one of the selling points of a one planet community. So here in summary are some of those. Clearly clean energy systems uh, will give us both a reduced uh, climate change and global warming, but also reduced air pollution. Low meat diets and smaller portions. So if we purchase 25% less food, we would reduce both food waste and perhaps we consume less too, which might help with our obesity problems. Um, I've touched on active and public transportation and so on. I'm not going to go through these in details. I, and this is uh, already been covered by Cora. Um, Michael Pollan, I think, gave us a good national food policy in his book, In Defense of Food. Eat food, by which he meant real food, not sort of artificial junk food. Uh, he said, food that your grandmother would recognize as food. So eat food, not too much and mostly plants. That would be a very good national food policy. Now, it turns out that the Eat Lancet Commission came to much the same conclusion, not unsurprisingly, uh, but they came at it from the point of view of how do we reduce our ecological footprint? How do we create a sustainable food system that provides healthy diets? And so we have to reduce red meat and sugar by 50% and have a diet rich in plant-based foods. Interestingly enough, that's exactly pretty much exactly what the new Canada Food Guide does. So coming at it from a health point of view, the new Canada Food Guide ends up with a low meat, high vegetable, high plant diet. Uh, so the two coexist and there's lots more of these sorts of co-benefits. I've already touched on the private vehicles transportation thing, but do remember it's not just about air pollution and greenhouse gases. And I've always liked uh, John Sewell when he was mayor of Toronto once described the Toronto transit system as the great democratizer because he said everybody uses it and you all have to learn how to get on crammed together young and old rich and poor black and white male and female you're all in there together and you, and he saw that as a social uh, role for transit which I think is a very interesting way to think about it so let me then turn to the key discussion points we'd like you to think about in the context of all of this because as um, as uh, Vic said, we've got 29 universities here from 20 different cities across Canada. So, what can univer What's the role of the university? Uh, and then also, what's the role of us as academics and professionals, as part of community organisations and as citizens? And these are the kind of questions I'm going to leave you with at the end. So, let me explore first of all in the context, of course, of this being the grand challenge of our age. How do we live equitably and in harmony and in good health on this one small planet? What can we do as academics and professionals? Well, community-engaged scholarship, community-based research. We should be doing not just lectures in lecture halls for students, but out there, educating the public, making public presentations, using student projects and masters and doctoral research to link to our local community, as well as all the international and national work we do. Um, 
we can be involved in public conferences and seminars and speaking series again not just talking to ourselves which is what we do way too much of and way too well and we need to be out there talking to the world and publishing public media articles i've some of you may know i've written a weekly column in our local newspaper for six years now um and none of that would have got me any academic credit. Fortunately, when I came to the university nine years ago now for my seven year stint, I didn't have to worry about academic credit. I came in as a limited term appointment and tenure wasn't an issue. And I didn't have to worry about whether the university thought me writing for the public media rather than academic journals was a good idea. Uh, but many of you are not in that situation. I recognize that. But to my mind, communicating with the public through the media is as important, if not more important, than academic and professional uh, publishing. What that means is that the university, and more broadly the academy, needs to truly recognize community service and community education as of academic merit. Right now, they really don't. It's research dollars first, teaching sort of second, and community service, which often just means service to the university community, by the way, and not to the broader community sort of third. I think that's unacceptable in this day and age and universities need to be relevant to the community today. And also we should be giving academic credit for non-journal publications, whether it's media op-eds or, or blogs or, or podcasts or whatever it may be. But that is a very important role for academics and professionals and we should be getting credit for it and right now we don't. Um, what can the university do as a community organization? Well, for starters, it could demonstrate leadership. So is, is your university divesting from fossil fuels um, in all its investments, including pension funds and, and scholarship funds and endowment funds and all the rest of it? You may have a, possibly a climate action plan. Do you have a one planet action plan? Almost certainly not. You need one. The university as a community organization needs to work with other community organizations in partnership with local councils, NGOs, business groups and others um, as we're trying to do here. Why not be part of a community-wide participatory futures process such as they've done in Lüneburg in Germany? Um, if they're not doing these things in your local governments or local business groups, then the university should be advocating that they do so. And we should be advocating more broadly as a university. Universities should be taking public positions on healthy, just and sustainable recovery, for example. Should be sponsoring and running speaker series and community conferences and events for the public. Uh, and I know that we do some of that, but we need to be doing a lot more focused in these issues. And why isn't the university there? At, at council, at the legislature or at parliamentary committees, not just talking about how universities need more funding, but how society needs to go in a different direction and advocating for that. And then as citizens, what can you do? Remember, you're not just an academic, you're not just a professional, even more importantly, you're a citizen. And so, for example, when I was working for the city of Toronto in 1984, it didn't stop me running as a candidate for the Green Party of Canada in our first federal election. And I argued uh, successfully with the city government for whom I worked that I, if I, I was not in a conflict of interest because I wasn't talking about local issues or the city of Toronto, I was talking about federal issues and I was a federal candidate. And they bought that. Um, so I didn't have to take a leave of absence. But more, more prosaically, perhaps you don't have to run for government, but you could join your local community association and get engaged with them. You could join relevant national, provincial or local organizations such as nationally and these days provincially, CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, uh, all of those. Had, are you speaking to your local councillor or MLA or MP about these issues? Um, are you writing letters or articles for your local or national papers? Are you doing blogs? Are you sending stuff to the conversation or healthy debate? Um, and of course you can run for election. And uh, I have uh, friends here at UVic who are running and have run in the past for election. In fact, the leader of our Green Party was um, um, here in BC was an academic who became the, uh, a Green MP and leader of the Green Party or Green MLA rather. Um, and then this is what we're doing in, in locally here in, in Greater Victoria, 
And as I say, our, our position as Conversations for One Planet region is we need to be talking about this. Right now, we're not even talking about this. Um, and if we're not talking about it, we can't begin to understand or, or um, uh, deal with it. And so what can you do? I'm going to leave this as questions for you to think about and talk about in the next 20 minutes. What can we do as academics, as professionals, as community organizations, the university as a whole, as citizens with community organizations? And who are you going to work with? Who are the, both the usual suspects and the unusual suspects? Are you working with faith communities? Are you working with the arts community? Um, what are the new opportunities that are out there? What are the new ideas? And so uh, with that, I will uh, leave it at that and thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, Trevor. Thanks very much. Um, as it happens, I don't see uh, any questions in the chat box just at the minute, but I'm going to suggest two things to get us started. Back to you, Trevor, for a moment about uh, what's happening at the University of Victoria about the Anthropocene group, what it is and what it's doing, and maybe just about uh, the attempt at having the university think about its investment portfolio. Um, sure, happily. I'm going to just alert a couple of people. Then I'm going to ask uh, Katrina to describe what the University Advisory Council is and how it might uh, link up with what we just heard and uh, so on. So back to you, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. So um, I'll see if I can get my camera to work too, um, now that I'm not trying to share the screen. So um, I set up a group at the University of Victoria a few, uh, three or four years ago before I left the university called UVic in the Anthropocene. And the idea is to look at what is the university doing as a university to advance this. Um, it's sort of, it's a struggle, frankly. Um, it, it's a peripheral interest. The university talks the talk, but it doesn't really walk the walk when it comes to a lot of these issues, uh, or it does in a somewhat narrow way. Um, so it's very hard, for example, to get uh, cross-faculty, cross-disciplinary courses uh, up and running and, and things like that. On the other hand, there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of faculty and some students who are, who are trying to figure out how do we make this, I would argue, we need at least a faculty for the Anthropocene and for that, and it would need to be a cross-disciplinary faculty, incidentally, yes. um, or possibly, you know, we should become the University of the Anthropocene. You might want to look at what's just happened at York University, where my former faculty there, the Faculty of Environmental Studies, has joined up with um, the, fac the, the, the faculty or school of geography to create a new entity that is focused on cities and that is focused on uh, the future that is focused on sustainability but the other thing is we have to bring in it fundamentally what we're talking about here is a is a shift in culture a shift in values that doesn't come through science we need to be working with the the people in the arts faculties the humanities the social fac science faculties, all of them have a political science business. They all have a lot to offer. So it really has to be cross-disciplinary. Um, and then in terms of divestment, uh, we've been working to get both the university and the pension funds to divest. We've had uh, referenda or among faculty, which are about 60, 70% supportive. I know this has gone on elsewhere. Um, the challenge, one of the challenges, for example, is pension funds. But fundamentally, the, the university doesn't control the pension fund. It's fund controlled by a pension board, and they see their quote-unquote fiduciary duty as making money for the pension. And if that means fossil fuels, it means fossil fuels. So uh, it's, it's a hard fight, but an important one. Uh, and of course, there is a global divestment movement as well. So it doesn't just have to be the university. Okay, great. Um, there's a. I'm going to ask David to uh, David Zakis to t give us one or two of the questions you've just put on the chat box, and then after that, uh, Corinne, please. So, David, could you do that rather than my just repeating them? Hi. Uh, thanks, Vic. Thanks so much, uh, and I'll do this again, uh, Cora and Trevor. Just uh, very quickly, I was wondering if there are other Canadian cities involved in the One Planet Initiative. 
and is there a list of them and also cities internationally? Sorry, unmuting myself there. So there's the four that I noted on the screen that are involved in the initial pilot project. So Durban, South Africa, Elsinore in Denmark, and Oxfordshire in the UK. Uh, there's no other Canadian city. So we, uh, when Bioregional initiated this project, uh, they wanted a Canadian uh, city example and they approached us um, and we'd already been working with Saanich and Victoria uh, on evaluating their ecological footprint. So we, we suggested them. Uh, so right now there's no other municipality directly engaged, but there are some local examples of neighborhoods um, and building developments actually that are using the One Planet uh, living model. So ZB in Montreal is using the One Planet living model. Uh, we've also worked with um, a, in a location in Guelph, um, the, a Baker Street development in Guelph using the One Planet living model. Um, and uh, in terms of the ecological footprint assessments, we've been working right now with 10 BC communities uh, to develop their ecological footprint and consumption-based emissions. So we're hoping to also extend uh, what we've been doing in Saanich to Greater Victoria and hopefully to all of Vancouver Island. Um, so the, I think there was two other, well, you have one about okay. the schools? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah, how did you get into the schools? So they were actually the easiest. Um, one of the, it's a bit more challenging to engage the businesses. Businesses always see themselves as very busy, and um, it just I, I think the One Planet model really aligned well with um, their curriculum as well, so they could integrate it into their curriculum. So a couple of the schools, including uh, Mark Newfeld, Vic's son, it just aligns. He, well, it aligned with what he was already delivering as well. And it provides a nice framework for them to help guide students' action. Uh, Bioregional UK is developing a platform as well to enable students to have a portfolio online. So the, this One Planet portfolio, so they can show how their projects tie into these principles. And they found so far, they've just been testing this, uh, but so far with the students that have been using it, they're getting higher grading on their uh, university applications too. So it's really helping with their university applications. Um, so I think it, it, it just speaks really well to schools. Um, we've been working primarily with secondary schools. We're now also working with middle schools as well. But I could see it <clears throat> applying well to all, all age group schools. I'm gonna ask, uh, th thanks, Cora. I'm gonna ask Corinne to summarize her question and then invite uh, Katrina Plamondon to comment on it. Corinne, please. Absolutely. Thank you again, both of you. I mentioned in the chat, there's so much food for thought, but I was struck as well by the messages that you were giving, particularly at the end, Trevor, in terms of calls to action. And they resonate with calls that I put out in public lectures and also in my, my course lectures. And so I was wondering if you had any ideas or if you'd considered how we can connect individual academics across the different universities and strengthen some of these messages that are already being embedded by individuals? I, could I jump in with one quick comment there? So at BCIT, so BCIT is based in Vancouver. Uh, I work with them as well, as I mentioned, on the EcoCity footprint, uh, ecological footprint. Uh, and so they're, the, what they're hoping to do at BCIT is to create uh, a new credential uh, for this. So that, that's not directly tied to your question, but it is supposed to be a multidisciplinary credential on advancing eco cities. And there's hope to uh, connect with um, all the di many different universities that can are, have the clues to how to get to these eco cities. Uh, so that is one potential opportunity for collaboration in building this center for eco cities. And BCIT, we should add, is BC Institute of Technology. Yeah, thanks. Katrina, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Thanks, Vic, and thank you for your presentation. Um, 
really good to see it and it gives me lots to think about as well. Um, so Vic has just asked me to speak a little bit about the CCGHR's University Advisory Council, which I co-chair with Susan Elliott, who is a professor at um, University of Waterloo. And I'm uh, at University of British Columbia Okanagan in the School of Nursing. And so Susan and I together um, coordinate and facilitate this table that has institutional representation from 29 different universities and colleges across Canada, all who share an interest in health equity, global health, and um, working together to identify issues, challenges, um, ways we can work together. Uh, one of the things that we consistently do at the University Advisory Council table is listen for direction from our membership and then design um, the kinds of, of very engaged responses, uh, the kinds of things actually that Trevor has just been calling for. Um, so I think that actually it's a really a tremendous example of a way of bringing people together um, and speaking with a more unified voice and amplifying our voices around key issues. So recently, for example, um, since June, we've had two joint statements. Uh, the most recent one just came out uh, about 10 days ago, um, calling on the Canadian government to uh, contribute um, in equitably, an equity-centered way to the COVAX facility in development of um, COVID-19 vaccine or a vaccine for COVID-19. So I, I've just posted a link to that joint call for action. We had more almost 120 people um, who are leaders in global and public health uh, from universities, from not-for-profit organizations, from health system settings, all signing on, um, speaking with a unified voice. And, and really we got quite a strong um, uptake from the media uh, I don't, I don't know if we, I don't know yet how much influence we had uh, over the government's decision. I know we, they did commit to COVAX. Um, the deadline was, was last week and we did hear that they committed. We, we don't know to exactly um, what amount they committed. So I think it's a, the CCGHR as a network of people really committed to issues of equity and this being clearly one of the most pressing issues of equity that that face that humanity is facing. Um, it's it seems a good network to leverage and to uh, use to speak um, and coordinate collective statements around. Um, and and I really love the idea. And we've been encouraging our UAC members to engage in um, sharing these messages and writing in their local like to reaching out to their local media. Um, to write op eds and to to really play an active role in having and being part of public dialogue about these issues. And I think that's something we can certainly continue to encourage and support our University Advisory Council members um, with resources and tools to make that easier for them. And I'm I not could, sure if there's any questions or comments about UAC or how it functions. So if I could just add to that, I think one of the things that there is, there is bound to be nationally, and I'm not involved with it, um, but I'm sure it's there, a similar sort of grouping around sustainability mm -hmm. and so you have to link up to them because they are dealing with the sustainable the ecological determinants of health all of that stuff the one planet work um, so making that cross linkage and not staying in our health silo but but stretching out particularly to that group um, is is going to be really important yes and encouragingly um uh to one hapless so one.org and um I'm sorry, it, it's just not at the tip of my tongue for uh, which other organization signed on to this as at an organizational level. So we, so this particular joint statement did include um, or organizations in that domain as part of it. So I think it's increasingly, this is really critical. I, I couldn't agree more. This is not a, a health sector alone um, kind of work. Health equity work is not health sector work. It's, it's all of, all of, society work and so uh yeah i'm i would be very excited to talk more about ways we can expand that and to um really there are there are a lot of people who have a passion for and want to see the public dialogue and and political sentiment shift and if we spoke together more often i think we could be quite influential great i'm going to uh, ask angie from manitoba 
about your question, Angie, on um, the food guide, et cetera. Could you do that? Sure. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Angie Woodbury. I'm a medical student here in Winnipeg, uh, Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about how the food guide is so expensive if you actually follow it, um, the most recent food guide. And um, I just think it's interesting that often like the effects of climate change impact those people who are already marginalized and sometimes who are already lower socioeconomic status. So, you know, a, a wealthy person might be able to afford to eat, um, eat better and eat better for the planet, but someone with uh, lower socioeconomic status can't if they're only getting let's say like three or four dollars a day for their food if they're on welfare for example so like how do you think we can change that or how can we talk to our patients about eating if they can't afford it like I just wanted to kind of start discussion yeah. um, it's a really important question and um, I, I did actually see an analysis at the time the new Canada food guide came out from the folks in Halifax I can't think of his name offhand um, and they priced the new food guide to the old food guide and figured out it was a little bit cheaper, the new food guide, because there was less meat and less all the rest of it, cheese and so on. Um, but it's still expensive, I agree. I mean, I think there's several pieces in this. First of all, it is frankly obscene that in a country this rich we even have hunger. And I think that we just have to get off our butts as a nation and say, this is not acceptable. We will ensure everyone has enough income to be fed. I'm glad to see the uh, Liberal MPs apparently put a guaranteed annual income at the top of their policy priorities for um, the, the new budget. Now, whether the government moves on that, we'll have to wait and see. But I mean, that's a promising sign, but we need to be thinking about notions such as a guaranteed annual income uh, it is obscene that we have 10 percent or more of children in poverty living in poverty and that's even before uh covid um so that has to be addressed also i think we need to be looking at in what ways can we um increase the costs of less healthy foods and less sustainable foods and and either subsidize or in some way ensure access we also have to look at things like food deserts so low-income communities generally oddly enough their food is often more expensive than in higher income communities so all of that has to be addressed this whole issue of, of equity and katrina was talking about equity too is key to this uh, but there's several aspects to this so there's a question here i see about the global south i mean the biggest one of the big challenges we face is when we take too much of the earth's biocapacity and resources as we do it means there's less for the rest of the world and low-income countries their problem is they don't have enough of a share of the earth's biocapacity and resources they don't have enough wealth to provide clean water to provide universal education to do all those things that are basic don't have time to get into it now but if you haven't looked at donut economics you might want to look at donut economics as a different way to think about how we organize society and economy but uh, and there's also an issue incidentally about both intergenerational equity uh, that comment i made about mortgaging the health the health of future generations and also interspecies equity when we take the amount of the birth biocapacity that we do we're also not only taking it away from other people but from other species and that's why we have a mass extinction starting because essentially we are co-opting their share of the earth's biocapacity and resources so yeah massive equity issues everywhere uh, but equity and sustainability have to go hand in hand all right friends our, our time is running down a bit i'd be in great trouble with my Niger nigerian friends if i didn't ask ngozi for a quick comment please ngozi and uh, then David Ngozi, please. Um, thank you, every everyone, for being part of this. And uh, I just want to talk about climate justice. And Trevor has already said something about it um, with respect to those in the global south not getting a fair share of the resources. But how are we, and what contribution will CCGHR be part of? in this uh, um, 
to to kind of normalize and better and remove the injustice, the climate injustice, um, even as we pursue this project. Presently in Nigeria, we have a group that is um, is interdisciplinary, inter-university researchers who have come together using an eco-social framework, especially um, when it concerns um, climate challenges in Nigeria. So I just want to also bring it up as we are talking about One City Project, as we are talking about the justice aspects of climate issue, let also remember, let us also remember um, the Global South. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we have um, the uh, South Africa, we have uh, Durban working on the One Planet Cities project in South Africa. And one quick note about the work that Jenny Moore did in creating the Eco City Footprint tool that we use to calculate ecological footprints. She's worked with a lot of com uh, countries, uh, with cities in the Global South and finds that um, not surprisingly, uh, many of those cities are living within their ecological limits. And in, in many cases, and this is not all, but many cases, these uh, populations are happy, happier too. Um, again, not all, but uh, many are happier. Our overconsumption is leading to uh, an unhappiness as well and uh, poor health outcomes. So. Um, so that's not entirely addressing your question, but I did want to mention those few things. Thank you for that, Cora. Sorry, I'm just butting in. Thank you for that. And um, if you look at Nigeria Working Group, we're based in Canada, academic researchers in Canada that are from Nigeria. We have to look for a way to link up with, maybe if we can get the link for this one city project in South Africa, in Durban that you talked about, yeah. and we can take it from there because we need to replicate this for... Trevor has talked about advocacy and all the interventions that are important. We need to link up through Nigeria Working Group and also um, NCHL, Nigeria Coalition on Eco-Social Health Research. Thank you very much, Cora. I'll get your email from either Trevor or, or Vic. Thank you. Great, thank you. David, please. There we go. Well, thank you so much, Trevor and Cora. It's uh, great to be on the same uh, whatever hour as you, Trevor, and be together after uh, quite a while. It's so nice to see you again. And uh, very nice to meet you too, Cora. And thank you so much for really a truly brilliant presentation. You've given us so much to think about. Uh, just this little bit of discussion now about food and prices, uh, makes me think of an article I read the other day about Nicaragua being 90% food sufficient. And it made me think, my gosh, you know, what, what will happen if our food uh, supply systems get disrupted? I'm certainly not anywhere near 90% food sufficient. <laughs> I don't know what I would do. So the whole issue of food sovereignty is, is really so important, in addition to all the other things that you mentioned on equity and sustainability and and uh, it's great work. I'm very, very happy to see, Trevor, too, how your work on uh, green cities, green hospitals in the past has evolved into this one planet concept. I'm going to investigate it further, be in touch with you, and I hope that all of us today uh, will have taken away something that will motivate us, will help us go forward to make a contribution in our societies. And a super big thank to, thanks to, to Vic, and to Corin and to Emily and, and all of those who uh, helped organize this today. And especially to you, Trevor and Cora, thank you very, very much. And thanks to all those who asked questions too and to have this discussion. Um, let's keep on going. That's all we can do, eh? Thanks everybody. Remember, it's all recorded. You can look at all this again. See you the next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.